All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. Another new episode of the Real Deal podcast. Today's guest is Jose. You guys already know Jose, but we'll go into a little bit more detailed introduction to Jose later into the podcast. But because Jose is the guest today, I have a question for Jose right to begin with. Jose, if you had to like gun to your head, you had to put a number on Girona's chances to win La Liga out of 100, you can put a percentage or out of 10, whatever you prefer. No analysis, nothing. Just the straight out flat number. What would that be? 30%. That's where I put it. 30, right? Sid, what about you? Yes. I'm going to go with 20. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pick a very safe number between two, you two guys, and I'm going to put it at 25%. Uh, and why? Mine would have probably been even lower than SIDS, but why I'm putting 25, I'm going to tell that later into the podcast. But right now, we're going to talk about La Liga. We're going to talk about Real Madrid, Barcelona, Atletico Madrid, and all the big teams and how they're faring this year. So let's get on with that. <laughs> podcast we're three the three hosts today are speaking from three different countries i'm currently in a very gloomy weather in canada sits in the states and jose is actually closest to real madrid he is literally in madrid uh welcome once again jose to the real deal podcast what we try to do is we like to talk about tactics numbers and all the other things probably that doesn't get talked about much in in the day-to-day -day business of football right now because the schedule is so hectic so i would like to formally welcome you to this episode hello mehdi hello sid and hi to everyone who's listening so i am uh, right now i'm i'm in madrid uh, kind of chilling doing a bit of a holiday doing a bit of a holiday while also catching a few football games and see if i can get some real madrid tickets but that's always a, a tall order yeah, Jose, we, we wanted this episode to happen, and Jose always keeps up with so many teams in La Liga, and it just worked out that four days before the Atleti game and 10 days before this Girona game, we get to talk about these big teams. You know, this is going to be big in the future. We can either call out Girona's collapse, correctly forecast their win, their, but, um, you know, it's we're going to lay it all out on the line here. I guess um, let's just start with Real Madrid, Jose. Like, what do you think? Like, this team has blown away our expectations. I think that's become the theme of the last two months. We consistently are talking about what we're doing right. Um, but uh, we've also seen moments where the defense maybe has some lapses that we've also come to expect that aren't going to go away. Uh, how do you think Real, I guess just starting with Real, where do you think we're at? What do you think of Carlos' tactics? Um, how sustainable is this? A bit of 21-22 vibes? What do you think? That's an interesting question because it is... Of course, a different team from what it was in 21, 22. Um, like you said, we weren't expecting that much, like things to go this well. And then injuries keep happening. And I mean, in the end, uh, Carlos' big merit, I would say, this season is the fact that he's been able to adapt to all the changing stuff. And it's like, like, for example, you listen to Barcelona fans saying, oh, yeah, like Xavi was brought down by the injuries and everything. And there you have Carlo Ancelotti just dealing with whatever gets thrown at him this season. Uh, the guy starts the season like already without like his best center back with that, without the starting keeper. You get no you get no start starting level nine and he still figures out something. Players get injured he still figures out something he manages to keep like he puts in player like the squad players and they all delivering are at a very good level so all in all it's been a tremendous management effort from Ancelotti and of course like some of the things are always there like of course the team is not doesn't press in the way a modern team would press but 
I mean, that comes with the package of Carlo Ancelotti. Within, with those constraints, uh, he's done a tremendous job just getting results, managing the squad, keeping everyone, like, focused and activated. And, yeah, like, it, all in all, and, and we've seen, like, really some very nice, uh, like, some very nice football at times, really. And uh, and in some way, and of course, like, it, it, at especially in the in the initial part, like you always wonder, okay, what if Bellingham hadn't gone on this ridiculously hot streak? What would have happened? What would have been the discourse around the team if he hadn't like if he hadn't had this kind of hot streak? But the nice thing is that Bellingham been on fire, like being on fire during that time, bought time. Uh, for say for Vinicius to recover from injury for Rodrigo to get back his form and now we are in a very nice situation where Bellingham is not, like just the team doesn't need Bellingham to score that often now he's in a position where he can do what we assumed he was going to do at the beginning of the season which is be more of the supporting attacker for Vinicius and Rodrigo so it's been and, and and all of this has been done as like a very natural evolution. Of course, it started the team started more, perhaps more Bellingham centric, but now, especially with the switch to, to from the diamond to like more of a flat four four two with Bellingham on the left, it's all been like a very natural evolution. And I do really look forward, um, just like we saw like in the Supercopa against against Barca. Like I do look forward to getting more of this. Jude, Vinicius, and Rodrigo trio, and see what they can do in Champions League. I would, I would just like to add to that what Jose said regarding Real Madrid's chances in La Liga this season. Ali and I, uh, Ali and Sid and I did a episode uh, in the beginning of the Real Deal podcast, and we were discussing at that time Madrid hadn't played any of the bottom five teams of La Liga. And we were still like, we were, I think we were trailing Girona by one or two points maybe, but our chances at that time were projected pretty strongly because we hadn't, uh, quote unquote, faced the weakest five teams or the teams with the least amount of points at that time. Right now we face or we see Real Madrid at another interesting juncture. I tweeted about this yesterday that in the entire month of February, we, we have a pretty hectic schedule. I think we have six or seven games in February. But the fun part is we are not leaving Madrid apart from the Leipzig game. All the other games are against Hetafe, Atletico, and Rayo. Uh, obviously, Girona and Atletico are at home. I think Rayo and Hetafe are uh, away games, but we're actually not traveling that much. So that and Sevilla is at home as well. I think we closed the month out with Sevilla. So in terms of travel wise, it's pretty chill, not too, not too hectic, although there are a lot of games. And there is probably room to rotate a bit in within these games. And also the fact that right now we have played all of La Liga's top five. We only lost against uh Atletico. We won against Barca away, we won against Atletico club away and we also won against Girona away so we have the head-to-head -head advantage against all of them already that that's just not three points that's more than three points and the rest of the games against Girona Athletic Club Barcelona and Atletico are all at home so that that's a good advantage to have too and uh, at the same time I think among the bottom five, we have only played Almeria. So we also have not played against the four of the other bottom five teams right now. I think Sevilla might be one uh, when we face them. All in all, like as I tweeted, this would be a catastrophe. In, in my mind, it is, this is going to be a gigantic disaster if we don't win the league from here. But what I was alluding to before the intro, someone retweeted my tweet and said never underestimate Carlo Ancelotti's ability to bottle a league title which funnily is is true it's it's not untrue uh, all the good things he's doing right now like hats off to him and I, I get amazed by what what a job Ancelotti is doing this season and I think to say that this season already what he has done with Real Madrid has to be one of the best individual seasons he has had at any club and this is a guy who has won five different league titles in five different leagues. He has won four Champions League titles. And to say, and we have just won the Supercopa, we're still chasing La Liga and Champions League. 
I think to say is that this this is one of the biggest things or one of the most impressive things he has done says a lot that exactly how much impressive this is because people who don't follow Real Madrid day in day out they don't know the key pieces that are that were missing from this squad at the beginning of the season. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, it, all those things do, do give me PTSD because if you look at all our league titles, like league seasons, the last time we had this many points at this stage, we lost the league in 2014-15, um, which is crazy that that year was also this good. I mean, that's why I don't want to get ahead of myself because the next few weeks are big. Um, even with everything Carlos done, Rudiger is playing every single minute and Nacho is not good and also playing every single minute. Um, and... There is a possibility Militao and Courtois come back, which is why the next month is big. I guess um, we know the next month's big, but any thoughts on the Atleti and Girona games, Jose, the head-to-heads? And do you feel like this team in head-to-head games, assuming everyone's healthy, you can't do anything if Rudiger goes down or something. But if even without Militao and Alaba, are we the most dynamic team we've had like in a long time? Like We've never had players defend so well at every position or so many players who can dribble, pass, and shoot at every different different position. Um, I feel like the floor of this team is actually comparable to some of our great teams, just in how, in any phase, you can't dominate them physically. You can't dominate them mentally. They're not like, like Zidane's first team, you could press Casemiro out of the game, rattle us for 20, 30 minutes. Um, you know, obviously, they were still better than most of our teams. And 21-22 Madrid, we don't even have to get into them. They would start so many games looking bad and throw the wave on at the end. Are we better... Are we more versatile? How do you see the Atleti and Girona games? And also, um, could you wrap up on how you see us doing in Man City games and other Champions League games, Leipzig? Yes. So I would say, so I would say well, about the point about the dynamism, I, th- I completely agree. Like it's, and that's why I find it a delight to watch this team because it's also it's also that right that it's it feels like no matter who you plug into the starting lineup, things like they find a way. Sometimes like. One could even argue that there are situations where, like, Brahim com- comes in and the team plays even better, so like even better sometimes than it did with the starters. So it, it's just quite nice. And then, of course, the mid the midfield rotation is ridiculous. So it's so you plug in so many players and they keep deliver and they keep delivering at a good level. So that's always very promising. Even now, looking at say the Las Palmas games, like Las Palmas has only gotten has only conceded two goals in a game throughout the league uh against but against Barca with like that uh, that penalty at the end of the game and then twice against Real Madrid like and uh, like we've been the best team at breaking down Las Palmas which is well like one of the most problematic defensive units in the league right now it's hard to get past them and it just shows like just that like how good the attacking ceiling is um, if you sometimes look at analytics, uh, people that don't watch La Liga that much more and more the numbers, it's uh, they're like, oh, the XG is not so high. But it's also because there's just a lot of game state baked into it. Like there's a lot of situations where the team is just ahead and then they take a step back. They don't need to be like full throttle the whole game. So it, it, it feels like this team, when it needs a goal, it gets the goal. And that's very and that's very important. So and then heading into I completely agree with what you guys mentioned about February and that this is the big one because really I, I do have a feeling that uh, when it comes to the league if the team survives February I think it I I think the biggest obstacles have been cleared on the way f- to the league title Girona is going to be complicated because on it like the game like I'm still wondering how on earth Real Madrid won that game 3-0 because honestly, like the first 20 minutes of that game could have gone at either way. Uh, we got outplayed badly by Girona in those first 20 minutes and the game could have gone very differently if they got their chances in. Something like this can always happen. And the thing is that Girona also has the ability I mentioned before that if they need a goal, they get a goal. So that's what makes them scared that's what makes them scary to play to play against so that's one thing then with Atletico they've been the kryptonite this season right the two defeats this season have been against Atleti they are a team that uh well yeah you know we're going there a bit later the story of Atleti is that they don't defend well anymore but they attack much better and they know really well how to do damage to Real Madrid so uh of course the one 
the Girona game, I'm even a bit more confident in. The Atletico game, that's really uh, where the fear sets in because we'll have to see... We'll have to see what happens there. We'll have to see what lessons have been learned from the previous defeats against Aleti. Yeah, that's for sure true. Um, yeah, and it's like Atleti just know us really well. Like, I, I don't know. They always have. I mean, there have been very few moments when I felt like we had Atleti's number. I think um, there was a time under Zidane when we sort of did, where we kept the ball like 15, 16. I just knew that we wouldn't um, get countered the way Barca and Bayern did in the semifinals and quarterfinals. I knew we'd play more conservative. But this year is one of those years where they are more of a bogey team, um, for sure. I guess um, before we move on to Girona Atleti, what do you think of um, Real Madrid against the Arsenals, the Bayerns, the Man Cities? Because um, I think if everything we're talking about comes to fruition, Girona is going to be a good warm-up for those type of games where we need to hit big teams on the counter and prove we're more dynamic. And... Very few big teams have a front three as dynamic as Bellingham, Vinny, Rodrigo. Like three players who can dribble and move at such high speeds and still get on the end of chances and move off the ball. Um, super rare. Do you feel like this is more dynamic than 21-22 even offensively? I think so. Like I do think it's uh, it's more dynamic. And I think – so I am less worried about this team's ability to attack any side in world football. I think they can figure something out. My bigger concern is actually defense. Like, uh, like that's where the scaling – like everything actually looks fairly ste- – kind of steady in some ways defensively in La Liga. But then you could ra- – like the scale – my scaling concerns come in Champions League where – uh, how you handle certain situations, how does having Nacho in there who like, okay, Nacho is not doing that well in La Liga. How would he do against top like Champions League contenders uh, level of attacks? How can he deal with that? It, like the box defending has been okay in, La, in in La Liga. Can it hold up at the Champions League level? That scares a bit. And then the other thing is what happens when you get pressed very aggressively by highly physical teams like Arsenal or Manchester City. Uh, Of course, the team has the talent for it. It's just that because Ancelotti leaves even the build-up structure a bit more to player decisions, uh, are there situations where the players could be rattled against a very intense press with like very physical players like Arsenal and Manchester City? How do they handle that? Those are kind of my scaling concerns. That being said... I yeah I even against Arsenal and Bayern who uh, I think I'm kind of confident that something can be done. Manchester City continues to be the challenge where I'm like I'm st- I still have doubts about how can uh, how can we make it past that. Yeah, that's why the Champions League draw is the biggest day for me because if City have to play all these tough teams and then play us, that would at least be manageable. But I don't think we can handle taking on Bayern, Arsenal, City consecutively that easily like we did in 21 22 but you never want to bet on beating like three four big teams in a row it's just hard it's football right um the inherent nature of those ties means it becomes a coin toss at some stage it's just top players a lot of money going at it hedge funds that have spent their whole lives like pumping up funds for those ties um but all right so let's just quickly talk about so yes real Madrid's defense hasn't been as good you can look at the xg so we are at 20 XG against and 14 goals conceded. Fine. Six above. 37 XG for 45 goals scored. Fine. But then look at Girona. They've conceded 30 XG and only given up 25. So pretty much we're looking at... All right, fine. That's that's not overperforming as much as us. They are only overperforming by five. But offensively, 39 XG and they've scored 52. Are Girona for real? Because like I thought about this all of winter break. I wanted to write an article... And I just decided I don't think I have enough to say. They're like, I think 20 to 30%. I think we were all in the right ballpark. There is a world where they continue this somehow. But for some reason, you look at those figures, I just don't think it can go till May, June. Like, they lose to us. Are they really going to go steamroll every other team for three, four months, continue overperforming? What do you think? For me, well, it's, uh, it's a tricky one because it, it's a bit what you say, right? Like, you look... At the XG, you look at the overperformance, and like every analytical, rational bone in your body tells you this cannot hold up for a whole season. But there have been teams that do it, so there's still like uh, maybe an irrational fear of like, what if they if they can keep this up 
throughout the entire season. One of the kind of scary things about Girona and even their overperformance is that there's no like specific player uh, that has like say a plus five uh, 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 goals over XG performance. It's all actually fairly distributed across the entire team. So it's not like, okay, if one of these guys stops being on a hot streak, uh, the whole team comes down. No, it's the whole, like, if, if I think if one of them comes down, other people in that team could pick up the slack. Yeah. yeah. About Girona, uh, what, what's what's their number nine's name, Sid? Can you quickly look up? I'm really completely blanking on his name and don't want to butcher it. Artem Dobik? Yeah, Dobik. So he he has he has been, I think, a bit of a revolution because right now I think he's equal on goals with Bellingham. And he has provided six assists. That's that's crazy. Like he has more assists than Bellingham. Uh Bellingham having the same number of goals is probably surprising too. But yeah, he he has kind of risen up uh to rack up those goals from time to time. Girona's Rise. If we just want to draw some parallels with some previous La Liga teams like this, like Super Depor or even uh, Benitez's Valencia was probably bigger than present-day Girona to begin with, uh, if I assume. Uh, how much of a parallel can we draw with a team like probably Leicester, who has done this kind of a thing recently? Jose and said, well, open the floor to both of you. Leicester was my first I'll... thought. I just want to say... Um... Leicester is probably the closest thought, which is why it scares me. But Leicester did it in such a bad Premier League. I just want to say, Girona are on a 95-point um, pace right now, I believe. So Leicester never got close to destroying teams like this, which is where there's almost a difference. I don't know if we've seen like something like this. What do you think, Jose? The same, uh, same thing. Like there's the like you mentioned. I I I don't think even in that Premier League there was a team of the level of this realm of the Real Madrid that we hit that that's this year. Um, and yeah, like it was more a team more, it was a more, I guess a, a way to call it like minimalistic in terms of attack, you know, it was counterattack. It's not it like, yeah, Le- Leicester city never dominated, um, never dominated teams in this way. So like what Girona, and of course, like Girona in some ways has access to certain talent that maybe that Leicester City team didn't have, but it's really, at least in terms of how they play, how they dominate, it's another level compared to Leicester City. But I think that's and also would, the closest would argue comparison. That City had, I would argue that Leicester City team had better individuals than this Girona team, no? Because like they had peak, peak, peak Kante. They had Riyad Mahrez probably also at his physical peak. They had Jamie Vardy again at his physical peak. So they had they had a few players who probably were would probably start for this Girona team anyway. Don't you don't you guys think? Yeah, but no depth. I think that's where it's different. Yeah. Like you look, this team has Christian Stuani yeah. off the bench. He's 37, but he's cooking like 640 minutes, only seven nineties, but he's um he's got he's got a few goals, nine goals and assists, right? Off the bench in the seven nineties. Um yeah. Porto, Pablo Torre, and then um, Jan Kutu, Dobrik. It's a it's a deep team. It seems like um, how deep? Let's see, three, six, nine, twelve. They seem to have a solid like three to five bench contributors they can throw on in any game. Um, what do you think, Jose? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I definitely agree. Like it does feel deeper. Like uh, yeah, I, I I do agree with both of you in the sense that. I do think that Leicester City had some individuals that are another level compared to what we've seen uh, in Girona, but I do think the squad is deeper and it's like, it it can really happen with Girona that like there are still a a few players off the bench that can come and really have an impact. I would say if Leicester was in this Premier League, they'd be fifth right now. I mean, in this La Liga, I would, I would argue that they would not be ahead of Atletico or Barca. Um, it's just go watch that Premier League. That was the banter era of the Premier League. Like we make fun of the Bundesliga. Go watch that Premier League. Like nobody good. Like you know, an eighty point team won the title, and like the second and third team were like struggling to get past the seventies. It was pretty bad. And um, also just uh, the tactics, man. Like 
Girona ripping through La Liga deep blocks. Like this is the gold standard for defending in modern football, this league. It's it's the 90s Serie A, but it's the modern version. Like the rules have changed, times have changed, teams are more physical, teams press. La Liga has adapted to all that and they still are the toughest deep blocks. Premier League was pretty much like a banter league before Guardiola and Conte got there. Like that year, maybe you could argue there were some good years between, but between like 2009 and about 2017, most of the teams that were in the Premier League were not really that sophisticated at all. Um, and so that's why I have trouble seeing this comparison. Like, I, I don't think Leicester could get to 80 in La Liga. Um, Jamie Vardy feasted Jamie Vardy feasted on these naive teams that would press too high. It was a bit like the Bundesliga at times. Um, because all you had to do was like sit really deep against Leicester, and a lot of teams just didn't have it in them, which we've you know not to discredit Leicester. I don't mean to do that, um, but that's why yeah, Girona scared me more. And um, you know, there's a chance that like half their team falls off, but it just actually makes more sense for their form to continue if you look at how many contributors they have. I agree. Um, yep. So thirty percent, it's it's scary, and that's why it's important we beat Girona. Um, obviously, we know Girona are a threat, like. It's this far into the season, a 95-point pace is unheard of. What about Atleti and Barca? They're both, in their own ways, a banter teams. Atleti aren't head-to-head banter, but all this hype, and they're, like, fourth, you know, like, 10 points off us, and, like, behind Barca at points this season, the so-called Barca that are in crisis. Um, let's start with Atleti before getting to the, the banter club. Um, let's start with Atleti. <laughs> um, okay. Yes, it's uh... I mean, it's mm-hmm. just funny though, right? Atleti having their great year and they're still 10 points behind. But at the same time, you don't blame Simeone. You look at their defenders, they're bad. What do you think? Yeah, I. it's a bit hard to blame Simeone from this when the recruitment has... I mean, in, in all fairness, Simeone has a lot of powers in Atleti. So, and this is something I thought about over the years because I keep complaining sometimes about Atleti recruitment, particularly in defensive positions and uh, and I think it's like can like is Simeone blameless in this I mean he has a lot of power if he asked for if he really insisted for something I I'd be surprised if he didn't get it so what's happening there why did did this team not get like a proper six since Thomas Party le- left so it's we like it's just weird the decisions there that have been made like they like the team hasn't really uh signed like a high level six or center back in a long like they haven't they have especially haven't made like a big expenditure um on six or center backs in a long time since around 2019 so so you and then spend the money on attackers and you're like and I'm just left wondering what's happening there why do they keep buying the attackers when it it's very clear that defense had to be reinforced and what we see now is ultimately the result of that like Simeone, for example, last year, he had returned a bit to the 4-4-2, trying to do more of a defensive plan. This year, he sees that, once again, those defensive reinforcements, well, the six didn't quite didn't quite arrive. They tried getting uh, defenders with Soyunsu, with Aspilicueta, who haven't performed as expected, and that has basically forced Simeone to go back to the 5-3-2, and to a more possession-based plan, similar to the team that won the league in uh, in 2021, and uh, and it works. And actually, this five-three-two more than a defensive adjustment, it's an attacking adjustment. It allows it optimizes better for the t- talent that they have at hand. It lets, for example, the wing backs Nahuel Molina on the right is not that good at defending. He's a wing back. He has more freedom to fly, to fly, to fly off on the wing. Same on the left. You can put Samulino, who is actually more of a winger converted to wing back slash full back. Again, he has more freedom to go forward. Mario Hermoso is not that good in a back four. In a back three, he's a lot more comfortable and spray passes all over the pitch. Um, and it also that back three gives more protection to the midfield. Who again, Koke is not the kind of guy who can cover ground for the sixth position. So in general, this lineup optimizes better for the talent that Atletico has at hand. It's uh, it allows them to be better in possession. It's just that it's just limited by the quality of the defensive talent. Then Atleti go and spend now over the winter transfer market. Um, they get what's supposed to be a six with Arthur Vermeeren from um, from Belgium, but even he 
is more of like a good passing six rather than a good defensive six. So run you run in they run into the same problem. He's not gonna improve them improve them defensively. So and that's the big question mark for Aleti doing any kind of title challenge. You can't do it with that defense. Yeah, a case of where even the tactics can't make up for just a total net quality you need on both ends. Yeah, like tactics have their limits and just seems like one. Is Axel Witzel playing more at center back now? Is that one of the big things they've had to do? Like we saw Sabe. He does sometimes, Still, yeah. Not just that, he's like their most reliable center back. Yes, because Savage like kind of he's like their Kamavinga, Kamavinga left back. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that that's that's funny. Um, so you, you expect Axel Witzel to start again against us on Saturday over Stefan Savic because Savage started the Super Cup game, Witzel started the Copa game, and um a little more security. I, I feel like if Savic isn't a top defender, there's no point even playing him at this stage. <laughs> um I've always felt this about him. He's not the best best athlete. Um so is that so was that like a more of a one off where they played Savic against us? Um, in I would Super say Cup? so because I would say so because right now I would say that Witzel is a starting center back at the moment. Yeah, his his numbers look good. He's playing ninety three percent pass accuracy, sixty one times per ninety, like up there with what he used to do as a midfielder in Dortmund. Big up on last year. So that's interesting. Um, so yeah, Atleti, when's our game against Atletico? Say, Saturday. Is it on Saturday or Sunday? Saturday, I believe. Did they move it for the Copa del Rey game, or was it always on Saturday? Um, they were actually asked to move it. Um, I believe. Oh no, it is on Sunday. Oh, never mind. I thought it was. Yeah, I, yeah. Because like, because because we're playing Thursday. How can we play a derby a couple of games after that? Oh right, right. Um, so yeah, we're playing it on Sunday. Uh, them on Sunday, and to be honest, it feels like. In the Champions League, I'm not as scared of this Atletico either. Like this, these more offensive Atleticos haven't always worked in the Champions League. They their whole thing was constricting you till you didn't feel like playing anymore and lost your sense of what's real while you're on the pitch. And uh, <laughs> they don't do that anymore. You know, they don't they don't make you go dizzy on the pitch. So instead, like the games are dizzy for neutrals. But um, yeah, that's where I like we saw a couple of years ago they had Luis Suarez against um and they played Chelsea and they were doing well. And they look terrible against two goals Chelsea's because the more, but to be fair, it was also Luis Suarez as a focal point in Europe wasn't the best in the back half of his career. Um, didn't really score goals in Europe, but now we know Atleti, um, they're like an upsetting team. Hopefully they can take out Barca and Girona and not make it so that we have to do all the legwork to win the <laughs> title. And hopefully they don't come and backstab us because, yeah, they lost to Barca, they lost to Girona, they beat us. That was not ideal for it, was good for neutrals, no doubt. Neutrals Classic team. Atletico. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're keeping neutrals interested. Hopefully, they stop all that nonsense. Um, next up, Barcelona. Man, I I think it was obvious the last few weeks. <laughs> we might as well just laugh before we say anything. <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm gonna clip this and post it as a separate thing. Like three Real Madrid fans talking about Barcelona or a Real Madrid podcast, the name gets uttered and we start laughing. I don't know. I think of like the best seasons of The Office and I think of the season of Barcelona and there's a lot of similarities to some of these comedy shows. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not even kidding. It's actually funny. Like you go, even some of the most diehard fans are just watching and dripping their heads out. They're wondering what's going on. And this was happening all season, but sometime in December after the Gavi ACL, after they beat Atleti and things got worse, I think that's when some a screw really broke in their fans. I actually, I actually have to have to plant a monologue before we we post our questions to Jose. I am genuinely curious. Is first of all, Xavi tried to steal Jurgen Klopp's thunder and it failed failed massively by like uh, resigning the day after. Like nobody <laughs> nobody cares about him resigning. Everybody is like saying goodbyes to Jurgen Klopp and then. How Xavi is trying to say this Barcelona job is so hard to do. The media makes it so bad, so bad, so bad. It's just laughable. I mean, it's he has played in this league for like what twenty years, and now suddenly it's so bad. It's it's so difficult. He keeps comparing himself to people like Pep Guardiola, Luis Enrique. He keeps drawing parallels with of his Barcelona with, with theirs, which is, which is utterly hilarious too. And also, I mean, uh, my team can play well because the media is like criticizing them. That has to be the lamest excuse in all of 
excuses history. So <laughs> uh, th that's that's really funny to me. And regarding Barcelona and Javi, what my question to Jose would be, I think he's leaving the team even more vulnerable at this stage by announcing it so early. Because like, look at when Klopp is saying that he's going. He, he's saying it when like Liverpool are still at the top of the Premier League. They can win a bunch of trophies. And there's not a single Liverpool player who wouldn't give their all for Klopp's goodbye season to be a bang, bang, bang season. But the scenario in Barcelona is not even remotely close. He announces this. Well, he says that he's been thinking about it for a couple of months, few close people he used to know, blah, blah, blah. But then he announces this when his team loses a home game 5-3. I mean, that's not really the place to say that, all right, I can't take it anymore. I'm out of here. So that was really funny to me. What 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 Jose thinks about this, I'm going to be curious regarding that. And then I have a few couple of other things to talk about regarding this situation in terms of what the media is doing, both Madrid media and probably Catalan media. But how Xavi is leaving at, at the juncture that he is leaving, how did you see that, Jose? Also, just a tidbit for you. He said now that he was going to leave at the start of the season anyways because he couldn't handle how they criticized him last year. <laughs> he got a contract <laughs> renew. He got a contract renewal at the start of the season. It makes no sense. <laughs> and a huge bumper, like a lot more money, like double, right, of what he was getting before, like eight million from. He was getting paid less than most top coaches. And this got him on par. So that's even funnier. Yeah, in, in general, like what, Ch look, like there's a lot of issues in the Barcelona front office. And I understand on one end, like the Barcelona fans that are like, okay, um, Xavi has been kneecapped by the front office, etc. The profile, like, li like, sure, Barcelona did some interesting business over the summer, but Xavi has been actually been more about the pressing, good pressing than good possession. And you got him players for good possession. I thought... I guess the objective was, okay, we were kind of not good in possession. We're going to make ourselves better in possession. But you get all of these players of which none of them can really cover. None of them could cover ground. Oriol Romeu, the Joao's, um, uh, Gundogan, none of them can really cover that much ground. And that went against the philosophy that Xavi was doing in the pre in the previous season. And, and I get the point. It's like, if we get better at possession, we have to run less. I get the logic. It didn't work out. And now you end up with this team that still is not that good at controlling games and is not good and doesn't have the legs to press and track back and run anymore like it did last year. So you end up getting the worst of both worlds. And that's been the tactical story of Barcelona this season because Xavi hasn't been able to resolve that. Gavi was able to plug in some holes in this defensive structure and keep it performing at a certain floor. He got injured, the whole thing came crashing down, and that, and then you get like this disaster January for Barcelona. And again, so this again to me, this is, there is some bad decisions in the front office that lead to this, like Mendes having too much influence on Barcelona's transfer dealings. But Xavi's reaction and handling of the pressure about all this, I also find it kind of baffling what he tells the press. I also find it ca kind of baffling. There are games where, like, the team plays... Like, uh, there are some games where the team plays poorly and he admits it, and there are other games where uh, it still goes wrong and it's like, yeah, we competed. Well, you didn't. So so it's almost like trying to create, like, this reality that doesn't exist. And then the whole press complaints. If this guy got the kind of press that Kuman and Valverde got, he had been gone in two months. So I like the press has compared to those to, to those two. The press has been nice to him everywhere. Yeah, like, I've also, been nice also to just to plug quickly, Sid, uh, as Jose mentioned, that trying to create a reality that doesn't exist that's actually everywhere in Barcelona, even in the fans, because the fans decided the moment Xavi took charge of the team, the fans decided that he's at least as good as Zidane. By the time Real Madrid fans got to know that, okay, Zidane is good, he has al he had already won a Champions League title. But before Real Madrid, because Real Madrid had a former club legend who took charge of the team and became extremely, extremely, extremely successful. Now, it was on the Barcelona narrative that, okay, uh, that's decided that Xavi is as good as Zidane anyway. 
uh, he just now has to win the trophies, but he's just like not winning the trophies that you have to win to prove that you are as good as Zidane. That was that was the other funny thing that I uh, caught. And also, you mentioned like Barcelona coaches. Remember how Zidane was treated by the Madrid media in September, October, November of 2020 when we were almost playing the Europa League? That that was because we were almost playing the Europa League. Xavi has played in the Europa League twice. So, <laughs> so the the as Kian says, like always shifting the goalposts, always shifting the narrative. It's it's amazing. It's it's just something else. Said so, 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 sorry to interrupt you back then. I think the biggest red flag looking back was like his performance in his first months were good. The coaching career was good. The marketing was amazing, no doubt. <laughs> um, the marketing <laughs> was top shelf and. I don't blame him. I, I think like anyone who's seen Xavi's genius, we've seen it in Busquets, Cruz. You assume anyone who's ever touched the ball like that will turn into a great coach. But why was he at Al Saad all those years? I think that's the first thing I've, I'm just wondering. Why did he spend six years there while all these other coaches go to a B team? Zidane went to Real Madrid, Castilla. Pat was at Barca B. Look at where Alonso's going today. So that, And Arteta was assistant at Man City. And then two, why is his brother his assistant coach? And like, why is there no thought, like, you gave him a bumper contract, you spent $40 million on Lewandowski, just go change the medical staff or bring on Juan Malillo, Dominic Torrent. All these guys are out there. Like, you can go sign them. They, But instead, they're trying to court more Bernardo Silvas and trying to fix the problem with more players. So um, I think, like, there is a front office element, but also it's funny how Xavi's made excuses. Um, my, I just want to say my evaluation of Gavi has gone up a lot in retrospect. <laughs> um, like, he was glue. And you could tell watching, like, what the hell, this guy is in every duel. But now it's like, he was basically like N'Golo Kante mixed with, like, a controlling midfielder. for what In terms of impact, if you put Pete Kante there, he held it together. And, um, you know, it's shocking how there's been no possession coaching from Xavi since Gavi went down. Like, anytime something happens, it's like Pedri pulls it off through instinct. But where is the deliberation? Where is the little side-to-side giving goes that open up the defense. Where are the overloads that drag defenders out of the area? It's all like like a big U where they pass it back and forth. It's like when I play FIFA and don't know what I'm doing. Um, <laughs> it's very static, yes. And that's, and I mean, that's the great irony of Xavi as a coach. Like, he's struggling to coach possession principles, Xavi Hernandez. So, uh, and it's quite interesting because when you follow, like, the three years of Xavi's tenure, the, the first version of, like, like, that first half season of Xavi's Barca was a bit, be- like, was better in possession because it had the veterans, these guys who have, like, possession principles drilled into them for many, many years. You had the old Alves returning. You had Alba. You had Pique. Uh, you had Busquets. These guys, get, these guys get it and didn't need any coaching to do good possession play and that's why that version could move the ball a bit better then the veterans leave and Xavi's left having to coach and teach principles to the younger players and that's where things don't quite work the biggest red flag might have been I think like you couldn't see it as a red flag but they played Munich Bayern Munich uh, away the first match day of the Champions League um, with Lewandowski or Awo Kunde and for 40 minutes they made Bayern look completely rattled. Kimmich looked angry, upset. And then they just fell apart like that. And for the first 40 minutes, the possession was really good. Lewandowski missed two open chances, point blank against Neuer. And then the collapse was pretty insane itself. The collapse was like just unnecessary. They didn't have to fall apart like that, it almost felt. And it's like they just chose to. And um, maybe that should have been the first red flag. It's just like at that time... Um, you know, they got some injuries to their center backs. They lost the Clasico and they picked it up in January. Remember the Super Cup game in January of 2023? Was that, looking back, was that more because Real Madrid just had no fitness um, that we just weren't like ready after the World Cup? Or was that them? Now actually- I'm absolutely sure that is exactly why that was. What do you think, Jose? Uh, I don't remember that much going into we, we that game. Three, no? The, the yeah. game where Carvajal got cooked by Balde. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, like, I, I think my memory, like, I, my defensive mechanisms have tra- have been said, <laughs> and then I try not to remember that that game happened. But I think the physical part is a, is a factor, especially when you consider that, like, what made that Xavi team good 
what's the physical intensity and the focus and that's kind of the whole uh, the whole issue since the possession was not good the focus was on the pressing on the focus on the intensity you cannot keep that up for for that long and that's the thing they burned out in term mentally physically in this past season this season they just can't do it at that level of intensity anymore and it's not for lack of trying like they literally came yeah. back from 2-0 down to go up 3-2 and they kept giving it their all but how many and i know albert blaya has the best line on this when you play a final every three days like it's just not sustainable they treat every three days they're running as if it's a final and like unless you're zidane <laughs> Well, see, and you know what's really funny about this, about Zidane? Actually, the last team I remember, um, so October 2014, we had just beaten Messi, Neymar, and Suarez 3-1. And I read an article saying, wow, Real Madrid, but they can't do this all year. It said they ran too hard. No way James, Isco, Modric can do this all year. I remember reading it, dismissing it. And that season, that was a very prophetic article, actually. They couldn't do it all year. And even James didn't have looked like the same box to box player he looked as in the first half of the season in the second half like he wasn't as effective defensively and i get that vibe from Araujo, Balde, Kunde it's like they've been trying so hard there's no more energy in the battery pack but they're still giving it 100% and like that's when you get all these silly cognitive mistakes or you go from 2-0 to 3-2 because the psychological effort is there but then you still concede 3 because you're cooked physically mentally you're just doing too much you're trying too hard um and on top of that, um, it seems as if, um, like, what's it called? The the mistakes, like, um, sorry, I actually lost my train of thought. I had a key point there. But they, they're just too tired. Like, there's no returning to where they were, I think, like, when Xavi first got there. Oh, what I was going to say is, if you announced you're leaving and they had some more juice, fine. But now they're going to, like, give it 200% when they're already on 5%. So how is that going to work? Yeah, and going back and going back to this point uh, that that uh, that Mehdi brought at the beginning is like the announce the timing of the announcement. I find it completely weird too, because that was when this happened. That was exactly my first thought. Okay, cool. How are you going to keep this team motivated to stay uh, until the end of the year? Can this guy keep the team motivated until the end of the year? They're already not fit. They already are out of energy. And now this is like a hit on the me- on the mental side of it. Like, I, like in a way, like, does he expect really to have like this club effect that it's like, oh, now the players are gonna are gonna play harder than ever for the Gafferness? I don't know, man. In this situation, it's a bit difficult. If I look at this move though, at Xavi's move from a political perspective, uh, what happens now is that this is Xavi's like Xavi has been the lightning rod for the criticism for the criticism lately. He cannot handle it. And by saying, okay, I'm leaving, he's gonna redirect that lightning into to La Porta. Now La Porta doesn't have, cannot use Xavi as a shield as effectively as he uh, as he did before. And I think a lot of this is also more politically motivated. Also, also because he said he's going to leave by the end of the season, no matter how bad things get, Barcelona can't sack him now because like he's a club legend. Uh, I think, I think they still might end up doing it. Sorry, Sid? I don't think they can afford to either. So I want, that's where like, (laughs) like it's too far. Avi's like, all right, I'm going to resign. I'm going to let you keep your money, do everything. You better get it right. So, he, I don't think they can afford to sack him. And I think that was a big motivation. And also, like, apparently he said he's not going to take his last year's salary. I don't know if it's verified or not. But apparently he said that I don't. I have no idea if that's true or not. So, yeah, they can't sack him. But what about, like, since we are going to transition into, I think, Athletic Club anyway. Athletic Club have been enjoying some good form. And seeing Barcelona and how their fixtures are, they still have Real Madrid, Girona, Atletico and Athletic Club to play again in the league. Uh, Jose and Sid, do you guys see Barcelona out of the top four? Is that like, what percentage of chances would you give to that? I don't see it. Um, and, you know, as far as galvanization, just a brief touch on that. Uh, I think what who they galvanized was Lewandowski because he knows like Xavi was his shield that brought him there. Because all the reports are that he went mm-hmm. and told, cried and asked Xavi to stay. Then he threw a lunch with everyone and tried saying, like, let's make this season good. Um, so maybe he's the one who gets a fire on his ass. But um, other than that, I'm not sure if Bilbao have enough to finish top four. There's part of me that wonders if we still see Barcelona finish second and Girona drop off a bit. Like, 
it's not that big a That's gap. That's the possibility too. Yeah. It's That's not a 15 point gap. It's never been a 15, 20 point gap. And eight points, I'm, I'm seeing way too many eight point things flip from January to May to ever like take that for granted. Um, so many times, like a couple of the Man City title races, we've lost when we've had leads. So um, I don't see it happening. But Bilbao are really good. And, you know, also, I don't, I don't think Ernesto can go back to Barca. I think that bridge is burned, but he's doing a great job. Um, what do you think, Jose? I don't know enough about Bilbao, really, to comment on this. Yeah, like, if I have to look at the chances, I'd also be a bit similar to the Girona thing. I see it a bit like 70-30, Barca stays in Champions League spots. And simply by a matter of talent. Like, it's just... Uh, keeping for Ale for Aleti keeping that up is gonna be more difficult. Like and especially like it, it's just one of those dynamics, right? That right now they're like uh, hitting cruise speed, they're flying high, everything is going great. You can only go down from there. And I feel like Barcelona, I think it should go a bit up from like I don't think it's gonna go like a lot up, but it could go a bit better from 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 now. So. Uh, so I do see it. Uh, I still see Barcelona in, uh, but it'll be interesting to follow the race. I mean, the story, the the story, a uh, player and tactical story of Athletic Club this season um, has to do well. So Athletic always had this funny thing for many years where they were like some of the huge XG underperformers in the league, simply because Iñaki Williams. Just cannot cannot even score. Could not even score uh, against a rainbow. So uh, now, but nowadays, everyone in that team is firing, and like Inaki Williams is firing. In a way, it almost feels like things work out better for him when he's starting off the wing than when he's just playing the striker position. Right now, he's playing more off the wing, and of course, the big the big big improvement talent wise is that the two big young talents sunset and nico williams are really start like have really started to fire this season sunset being that sneaky player that always receives well the between the lines acts as the glue in the attack that connects everyone um and then nico williams being like the dribbling match decider who uh in previous seasons he had already been good you could already see that there there was a great dribbler there but he's been adding elements to his game. Uh, the off-ball runs had improved last year, but he was still missing the end product. This year, he got the end product. And he's adding, like, uh, uh, I think it, it was a couple weeks, uh, a week or two ago, where he scored, like, uh, where he like where he scored that goal against Barca that was basically kind of a trivela outside foot kind of thing, uh, where it's like, okay, if this guy adds ball striking already to his capabilities, to, like... Uh, and by the way, I was going to say he, he's got a clause. Yeah, but he's got a release clause. This guy, I think, goes out because of that for like 50, 60. It, at his current level, it's kind of a bar. It's kind of a bargain for everyone in Europe. So anyways, um, so that's the current situation. The young talents are firing. Um, they also have in Inyo Ruiz de Galarreta in, in midfield, they have uh, a bit more of a... I wouldn't call him a playmaker, but at least uh, a more secure passer that they've been lacking for a while. The defensive part, like the defensive pairing with Inigo leaving, I was fearing the worst for Atletic, but actually the def the central defender partnership of Paredes and Dani Vivian has worked really, like, they are young and it's, but it has worked really well. So all in all, everything looks good for Atletic. My big fear is just, they're already kind of at the top of the wave. Can they stay up there or is really down the only direction they can go? You know, just a funny joke I have to crack, but Inigo leaves Athletic, does well for Barca. Barca still having a bad year. Eric leaves Barca, does better for Girona, but Romeo goes the other way and he's trash for Barca. It's just funny how it works out. Um, it's just funny that these small teams are handling some of these departures better. <laughs> um, yeah. But hey, um, that... That's good to know. And I, I just want to say Nico Williams, man, I mistakenly compared him to Brian Zaragoza. And Brian Zaragoza is a great player, but Nico's blossomed into something more. This is like, yeah. this is a proper, like, explosive triple threat winger. Whereas, like, Zaragoza is good, but he doesn't have that first line speed that Nico brings. And Nico's obviously just as talented on the ball, ball striking, all these things. Um, well, Bilbao, I'm glad they shocked Barca. And, you know, 
I think two Williams brothers is much more terrifying than the one on the wing. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, I always felt Inaki was a tough player to play against. And you put like a better version of him, who's his brother, and like he, then that's crazy. Because you'd say he's a better version, correct, than Inaki? Yeah. Well, Inaki, the, Inaki doesn't have the dribbling. That's the thing. Like yeah. he just doesn't have the dribbling. And that's kind of, and that was the main thing because then he was uh, more of an off ball threat. And, and the thing about Inaki is that even without the dribbling, he did a lot of things right. He has the speed. He knows which spaces to attack. It's just the finishing that has always been missing until now. I, I always used to get Inaki in my ultimate team because like he was super fast. He was super cheap to begin with. And uh, I think I had him in my ultimate team for for, for quite some yeah, time. He is an ultimate team legend. Um, yeah. All right. What about Real Sociedad? You know, a lot of talks of Alguacil finally maybe getting his big move this summer to Barcelona. Um, I don't really care. We'll talk briefly about the coaches mainly, but how are Sociedad? A couple of years into David Silva now, they've kind of phased him out more, is my understanding. Or how are how are their contributors? Kubo cooking? How's it going there? Yes, so, well, the, the big thing with Real Sociedad is that, well, with Silva, he gets, in, he gets like, the, the, the big knee injury, I think, at the beginning of the season. Since at his age, he's, I'm retiring, I'm off, so it's time to replace him. Um, it didn't quite work as well as expected, so now, basically, Real Sociedad has shifted more uh, towards a bit of a 4-3-3 uh, rather, rather than a diamond. And while they're still kind of a solid team defensively, because that's the thing, the big shift with Real Sociedad uh, under Alguacil, they started more of an attacking, energetic team. Over time, they've learned to be, uh, how would I describe it, more City and Arsenal-ish, like a more, kind of more boring possession and pressing team that aims to control the game as much as possible. Uh, so they have the possession control, they have the pressing, it's just that, they don't quite have, um, sometimes they're a bit conservative uh, in possession. The fullbacks don't really fly, don't, don't really fly forward much. And aside from Kubo, it's a bit hard, like it's just a bit hard for them to disorder teams, to disorder teams in the final third. They just lack that juice in the final third. They haven't really had that striker uh who can put, who can put the goals away so that's uh, that, that's the main the main issue with real sociedad is and has been for a while just the final third the attackers even kuvo can get dri can get dribbles in but aside from that hot streak at the beginning of the season uh, of the season he's not he's good but he's not elite in terms of end product so he's struggling with that Oyar Sabal has better end product, but then he cannot dribble. Uh, and they don't really have the striker figure at the moment. They try do it like they tried doing signings. They did that signing of Umar Sadiq last year, but then he got a big injury. Then this year he hasn't really come uh come back like in good form. So they don't really have that striker who can turn those possessions into goals. Uh, and over and and overall, the team has just been a bit weaker this year. The funny thing is that they've been weaker in the league, and then they did an amazing job in their Champions League group. Oh, so do you think they can beat PSG? Uh, Mehdi, is that what you're going to ask too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I was, I was going to get to that at some point. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question, I guess, with them. Um, I mean, by what you're saying, I'd say like that's still maybe the better end of the like cost benefit spectrum than Atleti where like if you're defensive and you can keep it tight through 180 and just nick a goal that might be a better tactic than going four five seven goals on both ends um, against these big teams but you know it's it's not easy but I think a defensive foundation is very good for Europe especially if it's with the ball like you're not just going to bend down and give them the ball you're going to keep it and Sociedad are actually always annoying against most teams except Barcelona I think they did better against Barca this year if I'm not wrong let me look it up uh, no, they remember. were terrible against Barcelona. Uh, okay, so the usual, more of the same. Uh, <laughs> so the, so the usual, yes. Uh, and 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 that's the thing. Like it's a bit like this Arsenal situation, where like I don't have that much trust in Arsenal for a tie for for the tie for the Premier League title, but I think they're quite dangerous in Champions League because they have 
be, because they, they have that defensive grid that's really useful for knockout competitions. And I do see that also in Real Sociedad. I think their defensive level, like the individuals, like the center backs, for example, I feel like they're not doing as well as last year. But in general, I think Real Sociedad are a very well-drilled team defensively, and that helps them in cup runs. Well, the Arsenal of La Liga, you heard it here first, folks, when they eliminate PSG. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, Well, what about Isco Disco's old team? Let's touch on him briefly. Um, Real Betis. And we'll we'll wrap up pretty soon here if you have a few moments just to touch on Betis and Las Palmas. Um, Any thoughts on on Isco Disco? Like, scored those two goals and then they lost. Um, You know, he equalized against us, I believe, which was annoying. Um, Or hit the post, almost once scored the winner. All I remember was like Isco was performing against us. One of his worst games of the season was the first game against Barca, but then he made up for it with that 2 2. Um, how are Batiz? How's Manuel Pellegrini? Is Pellegrini auditioning like Carlo at Everton for another top job? What do you think? Yeah, so with Betis, the current, like the thing is that now Betis, so Betis are seventh right now. And if you look at just generally at the numbers there, like at some point, like it, for a few years, they were really performing at kind of a top five, top six uh, team in the league level. Uh, right now, it's not there, and it's just kind of a and it's just an age related decline. So what happened with Betis is actually very similar to what happened with Sevilla, where they bought a bunch of older players uh, in order to get like like more immediate returns, but then these players get old. And they have no resale value. So now Betis is stuck in that position where they cannot renew the squad as well as they would like because they have to get rid of these big old uh, wage earners. So um, that's been the, the big difference between Betis and Sevilla. And the reason they're not like in relegation spots like Sevilla is that they actually, they're old, the old guys they're purchasing were actually good. Sevilla did a bad, did very bad decisions with a lot of those signings. Well, Betty's decisions, they were old, but they were good and they did a good job. So uh, so now the decline is a bit more graceful and Betty's has a more stable project, more stable front office that makes good decisions and they have a better coach in Manuel Pellegrini. So his, despite the decline of the squad, he's been able to keep the ship a bit steady but all in all, everything has declined compared to the last two compared to the last two three years. Like they defend a bit worse. They've lost. Uh, and the thing is that whenever an opportunity comes up to sell a player, they take it. Like uh, they just sold right now Luis Enrique, like their their good winger. Where was it that? Oh yeah, they're selling it. Uh, I think they were selling him to Botafogo, like to the whole John Texter group, and he might make it make it to one of his other teams eventually but like they sold there they sold one of their center backs to Saudi Arabia the defense got worse so all in all uh just Betis right now is in a position where they really have to renew the squad and right now they're just selling away as much as they can in order to renew so that has an effect on performance. Pellegrini is doing the best he and even now they sign Isco because there's no money to make to spend on like a big young attacker signing. So that's kind of the position they're still stuck in. They are simply less good than in previous years. Noted. Um, what about Las Palmas with Pimienta? Talk of the town. Um, you know, we, Sid Lowe said something about how it's like watching Brazil play. And I quote tweeted him on the Real Deal account, like saying, um, you know, Real Madrid are like Brazil. And he said, responded saying the wrong, you're, you had the wrong team. I'm like, are you talking about Las Palmas? Are they that fun? Um, I watch them here and there. I wouldn't, I won't claim to know too much about them. What do you think about Las Palmas, Pimienta? Mm, they are to me, I wouldn't call them Brazil fun. Let's put it that way. Cause they are another defensive possession team. So the most interesting thing uh, I, I think about Las Palmas is that they've shown, because when I look at, say, your Arsenals and your Manchester Cities and their kind of conservative possession style, as I would call it, I think, okay, can like can smaller teams uh, apply, these principle, uh, apply these principles and control these games like that? They don't, uh, do they really have the talent? And actually, Las Palmas has been able to do that. And that's the fun thing about it, because they even have like the whole thing where they build 
one of their fullbacks is more conservative and stays back and forms a back three. Just uh, I see a lot of elements that I feel would be, have been inspired by the Pep Arteta train of thought um, um, in, in terms of controlling games, defending, defending, winning duels. Um, and it's quite, and for me, it's just quite interesting to see that it is possible to apply these principles into a team with less talent. Because honestly, what, um, like, I just thought that Las Palmas were relegation contenders at the beginning of the season. Everyone has been surprised by about what they've done up to now. So it is, and what was surprising is that uh, looking into that, like at the beginning of the season, I was okay. These guys are going to have to get some attacking talent in order to try to stay up. And actually, the def- the improvement has really come in defense. They've gotten they were like this expansive possession team in second division, and now they come to the first, and they actually become a really solid defensive team. And that's being the surprising part. Now, as far as Garcia Pimienta, he coaches good possession principles uh, in a way, but. I would I would say that I find his teams rather boring in the final third, and that's the thing. Like it's uh, it's real now. This is really like a death by possession team that they pass the ball around, and you're like, go shoot, do pass forward or something. It's that's the ma- that's the main thing. It, all of this defensive possession help possession helps them control games, but they are I think still the poorest or one of the top three poorest attacks in the league. They barely generate anything in attack, and while their defense is good, it's been sustained by their goalie Alvaro Valles, who is basically the best goal, like is the most informed keeper in the entire league. This guy is like plus eight. Uh, goals over XG plus nine, something ridiculous like that. So their defensive is good, but it's kind of hidden by the great level um, of their goalie. And all in all about Garcia Pimienta, say if he took on a bigger role um, at, say, Barca, my concern would be the attacking side. Like, can he, like, can he, can he coach and have and build a team that's uh, a bit more aggressive going forward because Las Palmas is most definitely not aggressive going forward. I wonder who Sid Lowe was referring to now. Like, I really do. I'm not really sure because he, he like tweeted about the Real Madrid game before, like the tweet before. And then he's like, it's like watching Brazil when we were coming back. And I'm just like, he might just be referring to Oviedo because like he watches Oviedo uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, or it's also just the color, you know, it's just the colors of the uniform, yeah. I think. Color that might the, have been the reference, the actually. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm, apologies for botching all that. Um, And Mehdi, before your thoughts, any team you want to touch on, Jose, other, like, is there any random, like, Valencia thoughts you have um, or Sevilla thoughts? Um, Sevilla let Rakitic go to Al Shabab recently, just a random note. Or Getafe, Alaves, any other team you want to touch on before Mehdi closes? Probably just Valencia in the sense that, look, after what happened with Vinicius last year, I was rooting for these guys to like go to the very bottom of the table this year. And every year it looks like this is the this is the year it's going to happen, like given their given their just bizarre ownership. Um, Every year it looks like it's going to be the worst year. And somehow always they find a way. Uh, to claw like to claw their way out of out of that rut and uh, like it's just a very insane cycle when you're a Valencia fan because it's like because uh, because at some points it's like it's so over then they kind of then they still sell more players hire a new coach the coach figures out a way to get them out and then Peter Lim goes and kneecaps the new coach like the new coach again and then the team uh, goes into a run again. It's a very weird cycle, and I it's hard to understand the ownership there. But anyways, um, so Baraja has tr- has actually revitalized Valencia really nicely. It's like it's a more standard four for two, sometimes more counter attack, sometimes more counter attacking. But he has like a great crop of young play uh, of young players that are quite fun that are quite fun to watch. So it's been one of the most pleasant surprises in the league. Yeah, they did it. We we have to have Lucas on the podcast the day Valencia actually goes down because Lucas I think among all of us <laughs> Lucas hates Valencia the most. 
Yeah, I mean, even when you mentioned it, I thought of, when you mentioned the Vinny incidents, I immediately talked to how Lucas said they hate us out there. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, it is cool that they did get that equalizer against Barcelona. Barcelona went up 1-0 in December against them and they equalized in the 70th minute. And, um, you know, Lunin made some good saves and we got the three points. So hopefully they're not going to come and screw with our title race as they have before uh, this year. But you never know. It sounds like from everything Jose is saying, we should be worried about that second Valencia fixture a little. If it's a tight race and we're playing them, I'm going to be scared. Um, it would be tricky, yes. Yeah, and also the first game, actually, it's notable because we actually conceded a lot of chances and Lunin made some wild saves. Like, that was one of the first really elite Lunin games. I think it's his best on the season in terms of post-shot XG versus goals. Two-point blank saves, if not three. Um, so, something to note. Um, Mehdi, any other thoughts you have? Uh, not not so many. And just the fact that I don't think there has been a time in La Liga where we're in February, but we're still talking about a team that's not Real Madrid, Barcelona, or Atletico Madrid. So, props to Girona for that. And I don't yep. think we're we're going to stop talking about them just yet they they have a big february for them too but it's just fascinating that we we have a fourth team that we get to talk about even even dip this deep into the season jose it's been a pleasure and uh, this was your first time on the real deal podcast definitely not your last we'll see you the next time as we will see our listeners and our viewers on youtube and the spotify feed of managing madrid until the next time everyone take care and stay healthy.